Welcome to The Happy Doc, the voice of fulfilled physicians. This show is about bringing inspirational, creative, successful, and happy health professionals to you. Get ready to learn how you can be a happy doctor too. Hello, Happy Doc family. This is Taylor, your host. And for those who do not know me, I am a second year psychiatry resident. I'm in that resident life right now. It's super tough. And if you've noticed or have been following the podcast, uh, the content has been slowed down because my schedule has been totally crazy as I'm covering for all these patients. I was recently on a month of nights and it was wild, but I'm back here and I'm pushing out some content because I love doing this. I love helping people. I love giving the positivity out there to the world and I don't think there's enough of it. So I love doing this. Um, To start us off, we got a five-star review from Love to Learn MD. She says, or he says, I'm not sure actually, Wow, I have just listened to my first episode so far, and it was amazing. It was exactly what I needed to listen to at this moment in time. Keep up the fantastic work, Taylor. You have a gift. Thank you so much. Love to learn, MD. That's awesome. And guys, I really appreciate when people leave five-star reviews. It pumps up our team. We love doing this stuff, but it's great to know that people are listening in and sharing their love through reviews. So if you guys are enjoying the content, please leave us a review. So our next guest is going to be Pagan Kennedy. And I'm going to leave, I'm going to read a little bit of a description about Pagan. Um, And this actually comes off of one of her uh, pages. And it says, Pagan Kennedy tells stories about iconoclasts, humanitarian inventors, and scientific visionaries. Kennedy's journalism has appeared in dozens of publications, including the New York Times Magazine, where she wrote the Who Made That column. She's now a contributing writer for the New York Times Opinion section. She's also co-producing a serial podcast for the Radiotopia Network. As a night science journalism fellow at MIT in 2010 and 2011, Kennedy studied microbiology and neuroengineering. She has won numerous awards, including an NEA fellowship, a Smithsonian fellowship, and two Massachusetts Cultural Council fellowships. She is the creator of Inventology, How We Dream Up Things That Change the World. So guys, let's get excited about this episode where we learn from an expert who has studied closely the inventions of man and the processes behind it. And I'm super pumped for you guys to listen to us digging in to learning about invention and creation with Pagan Kennedy. To find out more about her, check out her website, pagankennedy.space. You guys can also check out her book, on Amazon, Inventology. It's Inventology, How We Dream Up Things That Change the World. And you can also check out on Radiotopia. She has a podcast called The Great God of Depression. Before we hop into the episode, I want to say that around 28 minutes in, we had a little bit of a drop in the audio. It really doesn't take away from the conversation, but if you guys notice that little change, it's because uh, we had a bit of technical difficulty. All right, guys, enjoy the episode. To start us off, we're going to dig into the concept of ideas and inventions and basically creation in a lot of ways. Um, but before we get into all that, uh, what was it for you that got you so interested in inventions? Well, I actually have been covering invention as a, I'm a journalist and science writer, and I've been covering that area since about 2003, when I did a story about this inventor named Amy Smith, who at the time was not well known, uh, but she was uh, teaching at MIT and also leading these trips around the world with her students to gather information about problems people have in developing nations and to try to pair MIT students with the experts on the ground who are the people living in small remote villages who are facing some kind of technical problem um, to really come up with new solutions that really work for that setting. Say if you're, you know, in Botswana, you can't just order up 
you know, a new wire mesh when your grain mill breaks. So can you do something else that's workable for people there? Um, and really working with really respecting um, the people who have the problem as the, the experts in that problem. Um, so I, you know, really was inspired by Amy and she actually right after my piece came out, the MacArthur Genius Award people called me and said, we're, we're interested in awarding uh, this genius grant to Amy. And so then I actually helped with her award sort of behind the scenes and stuff. And so that really kind of got me going. And it was sort of always, I did a lot of other kinds of reporting, but it was always in the back of my mind that, you know, and I, I remembered actually one of her students said, you know, the right idea, the right kind of invention can change the whole, you know, economy in a country um, for good or for bad, you know, yeah. but they were really trying to look at, say, you know, irrigation systems in Kenya and, or things like that, that you could really get out to people and, and change their living conditions or help them create new businesses. So that was something that really interested me. And I, I thought, you know, it's almost like this superpower, it's the, you know, where design is such an invisible com- um, force in our lives that we don't realize how it's affecting our behavior, um, affecting how we do things, how we live, how we die. Um, so I, that was just always in the back of my head. Then I got hired by the New York Times. They had a column called Who Made That in the magazine for a while. And they basically give me an object usually an object that would look like really beautiful on the page. It would be like this beautiful, big photograph. And then I would tell the story of how that came into being and who came up with the idea and everything. And so I was doing this weekly. It was just like, I feel like I got a graduate education in inventology because like, I don't know if anybody's ever done that before, just like week after week. And the hard part is, you know, what's so interesting about invention is like, we know the thing, you know, you know, the super soaker, you know, the home pregnancy test, but you don't know how it came to be or who invented it or why. So it's really interesting that a lot of the people behind these ideas that have had so much influence on our lives are completely unknown. And many of them, sadly, I have to report made no money off of it. Sure. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Uh, generally the best ones were the least lucrative, which yeah. I, I'm afraid to say. Um, so then I kind of parlayed that into a book called Inventology and really got to explore. And I went looking, you know, when I was doing the column, column I was noticing these patterns um, that really surprised me. And I got kind of excited because I'm like, oh, I have these amazing people on the phone, you know, and I would actually yeah. start asking them extra questions you know because <laughs> I was like I can learn the secret sauce you know and so actually I learned kind of a bunch of different secret sauces but you know just some really counterintuitive things about how these good ideas come into being and what it takes and so um, but you know one thing one of the most interesting ideas and the, the idea I really remain passionate about is that the end users, the people, us, we, who, and this is really relevant in medicine, the patients and doctors who are, I consider the users of, of technology too, because they have to, they, they have skin in the game, you know. Yeah. Um, they are the people who really understand the, the problem. And we have a, the, we, for, our, the way we invent things is very weird and backwards where we have people thousands of miles away thinking up a solution for people that they've never met. And what we're doing yeah. is we're isolating the people, the engineers or the people, the designers away from the problem. But all the surprising and interesting information about that problem is in the heads of the people who are seeing it. And so when you can collapse that distance, that's when you really can get amazing ideas. And, and that's why there's a, um, 
there's a lot of really interesting work done at, oh my God, it's been a while. You have to forgive me. The book came <laughs> That's out okay. in 2000, a couple of years ago. Um, so it's Eric um, Von Hippel at MIT, who's um, this amazing economist. And he really looked at who are the most, he looked at some of the most valuable patents and who came up with them and how. And what he found is that these user inventors are particularly amazing. And that, so the people who, so it's not just patients who can be very creative. And we all know, you know, how patients are creating their own diabetes, you know, systems for dealing with diabetes with their phones and sure. making prosthetic limbs. And, you know, there's amazing creativity there, but he found that in terms of the most important surgical devices when, that he, he looked into the history of, four out of five of them were created by surgeons, mm. which shouldn't be so surprising. But because we've got such a weird kind of innovation stream, it is surprising. We kind of expected, you know, so that so that's, you know, I think that's really uh, interesting and So I know, you know, and since you're, and I think that what you did with your podcast is an example of this, like you were in medical school and you found a problem, which is, this is not making people, you know, this is not making me happy. This is really a slog. This isn't bringing me joy. Why not? And, and it's the fact that you, I think it's really important for people I think it's very easy to just tell ourselves our problem doesn't matter, um, that, or you're crazy, or, you know, you just shouldn't pay attention to it, or you should minimize it, or you should soldier on. But um, I wrote my book really because I wanted to kind of empower people to realize, like, when you find a problem, it's really important to pay attention to it and see it as a kind of gold. It's like an opportunity to, because if you're seeing that problem, probably a lot of other people are. And you know, if you're the one having the problem, you know more about it than anybody else. So you knew, you knew all about this problem, you know, and that's such an act of creativity to, I don't know, maybe you can, I don't know if you've already talked about this on your podcast, but like the moment when you sort of, I th- I'm sort of fascinated in that moment where you, that problem turns into a creative act. It's a very magical yeah. thing. And I'm wondering about yours. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. So, um, you know, the moment I, ha- I have so many questions to ask you also, but the, the moment for me where I had this aha moment, um, it was actually interesting. So I was extremely frustrated. I'm actually an avid meditator as well. Um, And so I was very frustrated um, and I was unhappy. I was physically exhausted. My back was hurting, like all this stuff that just wasn't a thing for me before medical school. Um, And I was like, like, what the heck? Like, why can't I be excited about this? And I was literally just meditating um, after kind of starting to reach out to some doctors a little bit. Um, and I was sitting there in silence and then this idea just dawned on me, like out of nowhere, just like a moment of clarity. And not only that, but during that moment, like my system, like felt invigorated. So it wasn't just like the, excuse me, it wasn't just the idea itself, but I literally felt physically like expansive. And, and the idea was simple. It was just like record this thing and share it with people. And I know they're going to love it. Um, and that was like, it's just a simple idea, but it made so much sense as the idea came that this would be something that, you know, even if I don't find a solution, like just having that shared experience, um, on something like a podcast, I knew, I knew could be extremely helpful for people. So that was kind of that moment, that moment for me. Um, and I guess uh, just to kind of reflect that to you, was there a, a creative moment like that? that you've had, that you had like that, that aha kind of eureka section in your life? Um, well, just to, I just want to pinpoint, yeah, sort of pinpoint sure. something you said, which is you went, said the word frustration and that, you know, so there's different kinds of invention, but of this user generated, of the kind of invention that 
emerges out of an unseen problem. Mm -hmm. The word, the emotion is frustration that somebody is trying to do something and they're feeling very, very frustration. And, and I think when we say the word frustration, it's actually a kind of create of observational creativity. We're suddenly noticing the world around us in a, in a more interesting way, you know, like this isn't working. Whereas if everything's working smoothly, you kind of don't see your surroundings, you know, you take things for granted. So there's that, um, that emotion of frustration is a very creative one. And it's something, you know, that people should really try to harness, I think as much as possible. Mm. Like if you just stop when you're feeling that and kind of, you like, as you did, say, wait a sec, maybe there's something here, you know, and really look into it. Um, right. But yeah, for me, I mean, I, my, um, I, I just feel so lucky that my work life is so cool. I mean, I, I've been um, a freelance writer, novelist, science writer, um and also now I do, I actually did my own podcast recently. I did a, I co-produced a, a serial podcast for Radio Amazing. Sophia. Um, and that, and that was really exciting to move into a new format. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm sort of often on the hunt for the kind of overlooked story that just makes me feel like I cannot believe somebody hasn't jumped on this or, you know, mm -hmm. that raises my own curiosity and stuff. And so I'd spend a lot of time foraging. Sure. Say. Yeah. Tons of foraging. Um, so, and that's another creative, you know, there's a kind of improvisational, that's another kind of piece of, of creativity, I think is where um, you're kind of looking for the happy accident. So I, I wanted to poke in here uh, in terms of some uh, some questions that came to me as you're speaking. You know, you you've been a reporter, you've been a writer. You started your like podcast. You've made the this in several in many books, like eleven books, right? So yeah. so you've just been such a prolific writer and also questioner and uh, looking at problems. And and so something that comes to mind, and this is very specific even to me in podcasting is how do you effectively ask good questions or figure out what problems are even important problems to tackle? Because, you know, as a, as a person such as myself, like, yeah, I can witness and view lots of problems or issues, but, you know, some of them are maybe more important to tackle than others. So how do you, I mean, I guess it's a two-part que question here I'm asking. Number one is how do you effectively make good questions? And number two, how do you identify what problems are worth solving? Well, I have to be honest with you. Like, I mean, being a writer is definitely different from being an inventor. So kind of what I'm looking for is a question that's really important that I know a lot of people really are hungry to have answered. But I'm looking to often to marry it to a good story mm -hmm. or or I've noticed something counterintuitive in the media. We love anything counterintuitive. So, yeah. and readers love that. And so I'm looking to find something. If I, if I notice something and I think that is crazy, I can't believe that, but it, that's not enough often. So, to, so I'm also kind of looking to how do I put that into a story that people you know, with characters and, you know, stuff. Mm. So I'm kind of, so an example with that, of that would be when I was actually reporting on the book in Ventology, one of the things being a not so young person, I was like kind of fascinated that there are these, um, there's all this data about from European patent, patent holders for some reason, there was this huge study of, thousand, you know, more than a thousand European patent holders, who they are, how they did it why they did it, you know, were they working in industry, were they, which was just like gold for me, you know, there's so mm -hmm. much information in there. But one thing I noticed was that they were much, you know, we have like this kind of Silicon, Silicon Valley mythology of everybody being, you know, a 25 year old white male in a hoodie. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, it was exciting for me to see that, you know, the actual, the, the most successful patent holders whose patents were cited the most and stuff were actually not exactly what you'd expect. I mean, they were, um, first of all, in their 40s and 50s. Mm-hmm. And actually, the older you got, sort of the more successful often their patents were. Um, and so that I kind of held on to that nugget. And I thought, well, that's a really interesting um, sort of counter to the ageism in mm-hmm. right now. And then, but that it wasn't enough, you know. But then <laughs> I happened to see that the guy, um, John Goodenough, I believe his name is, who... <laughs> um, do you know who he is? He's, no, I mean, I just love the name. He's yeah, got a great, he's, he's an amazing, fascinating guy. He invented the lithium ion battery Okay. at age 57, but which is like right there, that's sort of what's telling my story. But then the awesome thing is he's still at age 94. I hope he's still doing it. When, he, when I wrote this piece last year, he was still doing it. He was still reporting to his lab at age 94, and he was on to a new, he'd made another breakthrough in battery technology that he wow. just hoped would solve this big problem. So when I sort of had that story, and, and then I called him, and he was like, you know, an interview, you know, a journalist dream. He was just like a funny, wonderful you know, great storyteller. And um, so I, I was talking, you know, so I could kind of marry that information to his story to give you, you kind of need the case study to really, just like in medicine, you know, you can't really absorb the information if you don't have the case study. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so much truth to that because like, for example, the basically most third year students, that's when you actually start going into the clinic. But the first like two years are kind of like rote memorization and just a lot of book work. And it's only in third year where you're like, oh, like this makes sense now. Like we apply it to this human being and it all starts to connect. So, I mean, uh, anyone who's listening to this from the medicine perspective totally will understand what you're saying. Um, And that makes sense, right? So you're not saying it's just, it's not just about when you're trying to do good writing or it's, it's not just about the facts. It's not just about getting that, that, that knowledge. It's, that knowledge with that case study or with that interesting person with that storyline, that's what makes it really captivating. Yeah. And I could go, I taught writing for a long time and I could go on and on and I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but you know, it's (laughs) it's really, it's weirdly connected to brain science because you're not just delivering information. You're really thinking about what hooks, you know, what, people absorb but also what hooks people's interest how you deliver you can't like deliver big globs of information you have to kind of have a suspenseful hook you have to withhold mm. inter- you know blah, blah blah I could go on and on so I don't sure. want to but um but yeah so I I look for a lot of the elements that I think can you know both keep people hooked and entertained but deliver information and then also try to tackle a problem that or a, a issue that I don't feel like has been talked about enough or at sure. all. Yeah. Sure. Um, what's one of your favorite inventions that you've tracked or followed? Well, I I think that um, it would be nice to rank. I always think about like which ideas have have been the most important and saved the most most lives, and so. I mean, definitely, I mean, this one's a little, you know, cliche, but like just antibiotics are just so incredible. The fact that, you know, they, there was basically dirt turned into this compound that could save, you know, pull these people back from the brink of life. And hopefully, you know, we will continue to have antibiotics, (laughs) but I got to, uh, visit, um, Fleming's lab in St. Mary College when I was wow. in London um, two years ago. Yeah, I think I was one of the few who went to the and the the Alexander Fleming Penicillin Museum. No, that's amazing. <laughs> and it was this tiny little room, and it was so interesting because um, he, you know, I think everybody knows that it was like 
this mold that landed in his dish. But what I didn't, I mean, first of all, you just have to see the setup. It's like this old creaky building with these tiny offices, which still are all dusty and everything. But the guys who were experimenting with mold were downstairs from him. There were um, some guys, there was a microbiology lab underneath Mm -hmm. him. So I didn't realize, and that kind of gets at the kind of weird, you know, kind of happy accident luck thing Mm -hmm. often involved, the discovery element of, you know, just... I mean, it's it's still very much about human creativity because you have to have the creativity to seize on, to see what that weird anomaly is. But right. the fact that he had a microbiology lab underneath him and that these mold spores were coming up, you know, was part right. of it. And so part of that success story was the cross-pollination of ideas that could have only happened that could have only happened with the proximity of the individuals involved. Like had that lab been, you know, two blocks down, these guys wouldn't have ended up clashing. Um, And then, uh, you know, having that conversation that could have, you know, ultimately resulted in a new solution. Well, you know, I, I mean, I guess molds were, and then of course, you know, these antibiotic precursors are in everything, like they're finding them in soil and everything. So it could have happened in a lot of ways. But what's really interesting, so that's, you know, I did a whole section on serendipitous invention or mm-hmm. serendipity. But serendipity we think of as luck, but it's really a kind of skill to have these happy accidents. It's about observational creativity. And so before Fleming, there were a number of people who were like, oh, like these weird, you know, this penicillin is weirdly killing this stuff. These, this mold, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, or sorry, the mold is weirdly killing the bacteria. What, you know, but they're just like, yeah, you know, they didn't see anything in it. They didn't get curious about it. Mm-hmm. And so um, it's the, I, th- I think those kind of instances where you see somebody have the clue right in front of them, but they didn't see them. I, I've heard somebody call them anti-serendipity, which I think is a really cool term. But, I mean, we're probably having anti-serendipity like 100 times a day where we're just like walking past like the clue to some giant, you know, problem of like alternative energy, you know, that we could like come up with some alternative energy or something. And it's on the bottom of our shoe, but we're just not seeing it. So, and, and that kind of points to, um, you know, sort of that eureka moment, like, you know, is it really a eureka moment or is it just that you've been painstakingly thinking about a problem for so long that all of a sudden something in your awareness, you know, strikes you when really it was probably there before, right? Like all this information's always around us and suddenly your, your mind's just locating that this time. Yeah, exactly. And and then talking to a lot of inventors, I found, you know, it's often a multi-step process. There wasn't one. It, the Eureka thing makes for a good story, but it's, you know, it's the kind of glimmer of an understanding, but then there's testing and then you've got to make mm-hmm. the thing work. And so it can often play out over years and years. And there's just a lot of, and, you know, that also gets at, I think the Eureka Certainly that happens to people, but it can make it sound like it's a lot easier than it is. And right. then you're, you're mentioning, you know, all this, this cross pollination happening. I think that's why inventions happen so fast now, uh, because or ideas are coming about so much faster because now cross pollinating with social media and videos is is really making things happen at such a fast paced speed that couldn't have happened before. Yeah, I think so. And I I hope that there's a democratization going on for invention where more and more people have the tools um, to, you know, turn their ideas into something. I mean, if you um, want to 3D print your prototype, it's really not that expensive and you can track down other people who can help you pretty easily so I think that's exciting that we have all these new tools and, um, you know, even kids like kids are <laughs> inventing at a kind of, it's really kind of intimidating, 
you know, these 15 year olds are coming up with these amazing ways to clean up the ocean and things like that. So um, it's really, you know, getting people in more. I just I'm very passionate about getting more and different, many, a much more diverse pool in of people into the mix, because I think the more people we have um, creating the designed environment, the more kind of democratic that environment is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to, and to have more people thinking about invention and ideas and being creators is uh, definitely something that I think is really amazing. Uh, within that vein, um, you know, what is something that gets you really excited to be a human being and, and to do what you're doing? Um, you know, whenever I uh, find a great, for me, it's, I guess I'm more of the, there's a lot of elements to to putting together story. But for me, what I love is the foraging and I love, you know, hunting and hunting and then finding say in a science story or in a random comment or something like that, something that I just know, you know, nobody's looked into. And I just feel like it, you know, I wrote a piece about, about the kind of way serendipity works, but there's, we have in journalism, this term of like, um, uh, pulling string or collecting string. And that's how it is. It's like, oh, wow, there's this really weird kind of clue. What is that attached to? And you feel like you're kind of pulling and pulling and often it goes nowhere. But when you really keep pulling and it's connected to something else and that and that and the hunt, you know, for me is so exciting. And I love interviewing people. And I feel like, you know, the best stories, I think I know what the story is. I think I know what um, when I call up the person, what they're going to say, I'm just kind of going to put them in a slot. And then they say, like, it just completely blows up mm. my idea of, you know, what they say is so much more interesting and weird and fascinating than anything I expected. It leads in new directions. And that's really, to me, the joy of discovery is, is, is the joy of, of creating. I love that. that. That was a fantastic answer. Um, thank you so much for answering all my questions, Pagan Kennedy. Um, it's been uh, it's been great to have you on today um, and to learn so much from you. I, I really do think that you just have so much knowledge. Um, before you go, is there any way that our listeners can learn more about you? Sure. I have a um, podcast at paganKennedy.space. And my book, Inventology, is around for, yep. for sale and uh, at the library if you don't want to buy it. <laughs> and I have a, I'm a contributing writer at the New York Times, so I have a ton of work on the New York Times site. Thank you so much for listening to the Happy Doc Podcast, the voice of fulfilled physicians. If you enjoyed the episode, please drop us a like, comment, and share. Share us through the social media channels we have on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The handle is at Happy Doc Podcast. That's at Happy Doc Podcast. You can find our website at www.thehappydoc.com. Again, thank you so much for listening to The Happy Doc, The Voice of Fulfilled Physicians.